Hey, thank you, everybody. So my name is Tom Tresser, and uh, I, uh, I call myself a public defender when I speak and visit groups. And uh, it's not about the law, but it's about the very concept of the word public. So I think in this city and in this country right now, the very nature, the very word public is under attack. Do we agree? Public education, public housing, public transportation, public health, public, very, very <laughs> public parking. <laughs> oh, ouch. Uh, even public space is all under threat. Of, oh, don't let's forget public education. All under threat of being privatized. And what do we mean by that? We mean taking that which is owned by everyone, or really not owned is not really the right word, that which is in trust to be used by everyone as a public asset being monetized for private profit. That is to say, things which belong to all of us are being strip mined for the benefit of a few insiders. We're talking about big money and big corporations who, after they burn their own houses down in the financial meltdown of 2007 and 2008, are seeking guaranteed no risk returns, and they're coming after our stuff. I mean, that's basically what is going on here. The parking meter deal is only the tip of the iceberg. Our current mayor is surrounded by privatizers. He himself is a privatizer and an investment banker, and we're in the city of privatization right now. So that's, that's the, a context of, of what gets me up in the morning. And so I call myself a public defender because I think the very word public needs to be defended. Uh, so I'm an opponent of privatization, and I say we need more public, not less public. You agree with me? More public. Well, <clears throat> over the years, uh, running around the city, uh, doing various campaigns, talking to neighbors all over the place, I think I've probably been in every ward, you're always faced with a, a, a bit of a conundrum when you're trying to explain some of these complex matters and you have maybe 10 minutes or 15 minutes, how do you do that? What's the best way to explain budgets, um, politics, policy? And I, I think that we, as, I, as you can see, I'm of a certain age. <laughs> we old schoolers are, are using PowerPoints and, gra and flyers, and I'm going to give you a, a, another boring PowerPoint presentation here in a minute. Is that the best way to communicate to people? And younger people are using Facebook and YouTube and Twitter, and they're using different tools to communicate with each other and to, um, to persuade each other and to connect with each other. And so after kicking this stuff around for 20 years or so, we've come up with the Civic Lab. So the Civic Lab is a space for civic innovation. Uh, we're here in the West Loop, 114 North Aberdeen, on the first floor of an old firehouse. And it's really a place where old school Chicago organizers like me that were schooled in the Alinsky style of direct power organizing, putting feet on the street, uh, correct, confronting power with power, meets the younger school of coders, graphic designers, data wranglers, um, people who are very facile with new media, right? But they may not be rooted in any specific community, uh, or they may not know the history of housing in Chicago or labor relations in Chicago, and why would they if they're under 30 and they just moved to the city a few years ago? So the Civic Lab is a place where, in the first instance, we have co-workers working during the day. Uh, we've got the Young Invincibles. We've got Move to Amend. We've got the, the Chicago Votes is our anchor tenant. We've got, um, in the past, Raise Your Hand and um, the Working Families Party, just to name a few of the groups that have used this space and are working there. So it's a place to come and be and help each other and create some fellowship. In the evening, we have classes. So here are a few classes that we've had since we started uh, just a few months ago. Here we have a class on how to run for local office. So when you're talking about building you know, an alternative to the Democratic Party or wresting power from the entrenched 
machine, what's your electoral strategy? I mean, you better you better have a way to get your candidates elected, or otherwise we're just sitting here talking, and you know we'll be meeting for 50 years. So, what's your strategy for getting people elected to office to hold some real power? Well, uh, come to the Civic Lab on February 22nd, and you'll take an all-day workshop on how to get elected for $125. That's a bargain, and it's soup to nuts all day. And by the way, lunch is included. Uh, here, here's a great workshop that I did. TIFF 101. Strangely entertaining, but uh, 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 it breaks it down for you in two hours. This workshop right here was do-it-yourself hydroponics. So people came and actually built ki kits and went away at the end of the night and started growing things in their home that very night. This class here is vegan cooking. So we also do things about lifestyle and eating. Uh, and we're going to be doing workshops on growing your own food, um, how to investigate your elected officials, coding for kids. All that is happening at the Civic Lab. We have a long list of, of classes. So we invite you to come to the Civic Lab, take a class, and teach a class. And finally, the thing that we're doing at the lab is actually building tools. So this is where the, um, the, the, the TIFF Illumination Project comes in. So the tools that we're building are, some of them are coding. That is to say, they live online, and they can be used by uh, activists when they get released. The first tool that we're building is an online calendar uh, that will hopefully host all kinds of things about civics in Chicago, one place to shop and look for, for listings. Uh, there is no such thing as that right now. Uh, but the other kinds of tools are more old school. So this is a tool. So this is a graphic uh, produced by the TIFF Illumination Project, and let's talk about that now. So the TIFF Illumination Project was designed to answer the question, what are TIFFs doing to me where I live? We've heard about tax increment financing. We know it's a big deal, but it's kind of, you know, can go over your head. So the question is, what is a TIFF? Why should I care? And what is it doing to me where I live? You know, and I live in Logan Square. I live in Beverly. I live in uh, Lawndale. Talk to me about what TIFFs where I live and bring it home for me. A TIFF is uh, a district created by the city uh, in which some sort of development is being uh, helped by the city. So you're a private developer and you wish to build a project in this particular community and you want some help. The city says, well, here's some cash or here's some land. So this TIF is from the Howard Polina area. So you can see it has uh, a number of properties in it. What they built that TIF for was the Dominics. So if you go up by the Howard L, get off the L, you'll see Dominics Plaza. That was funded by this TIF. Uh, and so what it does is it takes a snapshot of all the property inside the TIF and says, here's how much property tax is being generated at the time of the TIF. And now, here's money for your development over here. And now starting in the next year, new property taxes are being generated by this new piece of property, as well as other things that are happening inside the boundaries. And the increment is captured by the, the TIF district. Hence, tax increment financing. Uh, the qualifications for creating a TIF include the famous word blight. So if your community is blighted, that's a reason to go for the TIF program. But in Chicago, it's become so elastic as to lose its meaning because they created a TIF district in the central business district, LaSalle Street and The Loop, were created TIF districts. So how is that blighted? In my community up in Lincoln Park, um, there's the Apple Store, <laughs> and then right across the street from that is uh, Grossinger's Auto, which got $8.5 million to move 10 blocks from where they were on Wells and Division to the hottest retail district in Chicago with eight and a half of our million dollars of our money. Apparently, Mr. Grossinger couldn't make it on his own, and he said, I'm, I've got all this blight here right across the street from the Apple Store. So it, basically, in the city of Chicago, that term has lost its meaning. The process for creating a TIF is kind of complicated. There's all this flow chart here. But really, uh, let's get real. It's really, that's really the story. The mayor points and the aldermen go. That's a statue uh, a installation in the uh, south of the park where it's a bunch of creatures there without any heads. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, but I, I say that's the city council members on their way to, to a meeting. 
because they don't need these. So the mayor basically says, thou shalt have a tiff and thou shalt have a tiff. If you do not want a tiff and the mayor wants one, you'll get one. If you want something uh, and the mayor doesn't want one, you won't get it. So it's really, it's really up to the mayor. So this explains a little bit. This is a, the famous um, diagram you'll see all the time in the discussion of TIFs. So this is the base of the property taxes that have been generated by those properties in the TIF district before this whole thing got started, right? So in Chicago, the units of government that rely on that base for their operation are schools, libraries, parks, the city itself, the county, right? So we need to be mindful of anything that's intercepting TIF money or property taxes and taking them away from the operation of, un of our government, right? That's something that we need to be aware of. Well, this is how the, how the TIFs operate. They take that increment for 23 years. So the amount of property taxes that were going to the units of government before the TIF got created stay the same. It's flat. And all that increment, all that new value, it gets sucked up and gets put into a, essentially a slush fund controlled by the mayor. There's quite a few TIFs in Chicago right now, 154 districts taking up about 30% of the land. No other city in America comes close. So we're number one. Yay for Chicago. In uh, 2013, uh, the latest numbers we have coming in, uh, it's about 435 TIF districts throughout the whole county. You can see them spread out way beyond just the, the borders of the city. And you can see the amount of, of uh, TIFs have increased drastically starting when the, first mayor, the second Mayor Daley came into office. So we think someone inside Mayor Daley, the second shop, figured this out pretty fast. And look at this straight up, like a 45 degree angle. And the revenue is staggering, about a billion dollars every two years. These are property tax dollars we're talking about. Property tax dollars taken right off the top. Uh, so the last number we have for 2012 is uh, $457 million. So it's a fair question to ask what happened to all that money. The grand total since TIFs got started back under Mayor Washington is $5.5 billion. So this is the, two, the, 12, the total for 2012. If you include um, the city of Chicago, 457. The other TIFs that are outside the city's border, but still inside Cook County, 266, grand total, almost three quarters of a billion dollars in property taxes sucked up by TIFs in the county of Cook. <clears throat> grand total, since TIFs were created, just for one county, it's almost $10 billion. Now you start to, 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 to play with these numbers and you start to wonder, I wonder, if we're really broke, are we really broke if we, can, if we can pull this much property tax money kind of off the table, right, and send it to we know not where? Well, actually, we know a good deal about where. But that's a lot of money to go missing. Now, with these big numbers, you would think that they would show up on your property tax bill, right? So you, you live in a TIF district, and you, and you get your property tax bill. But guess what? Not so much. So this is a real property tax bill from a, a lady that lives in the Englewood TIF district. Now, Englewood, for, for some people, would say, yes, that is a blighted community. They got a lot of problems, a lot of vacant storefronts, a lot of crime, a lot of uh, disinvestment. So if ever a community needed some help, you might say Englewood qualifies. Well, let's see what happens here. So these are the units of government that are listed on her, on her bill, with the Board of Ed being the one that's supposed to get the most money, about 54% of her, her bill, and her bill right here is about $2,000. <clears> and here it is, the, the Chicago Englewood TIF District is listed as zero. Zero. That is to say, it's not doing anything. Well, the property owner will look at that and go, well, what is that all about? I mean, what is, it, what is the Englewood TIF District? Um, oh, well, I guess it's nothing to worry about since it's not doing anything. However, here's a, here's a multiple choice quiz. What do you think 
is the true percentage that the Englewood TIF district takes from this lady's property tax bills? Is it A, 13%, B, 24%, C, 54%, or D, 68%? Anybody want to hazard a guess? D, I hear a lot of Ds. B, okay, well, this is, a, this is a more cynical crowd that I'm used to speaking to. <laughs> the answer is D, 68%. So what does that mean? That means that her tax bill is a complete fraud. This is not zero. It would be 68% of $2,000 or 1360 Thank you, sir. $1,360. So therefore, you've got to replace these asterisks with 1360 which means everyone else gets what's left. So the Board of Ed, which is listed on here as getting um, $1,100, really doesn't get that. They get what's left, and so it actually works out to be about $300. Mr. Tiff took his $1,300 off the top. It's not on her bill, though. You know. So this, the Board of Ed, on this one bill... Board of Ed got gypped about $800. That she should have been, she, she, she thought she, she sent $1,000 to the Board of Ed, but she didn't. She sent about $300. This is one tax bill in one community, and there's 154 of these TIF districts across the city. So it's no wonder that our city is hurting, right? Because this is going on year after year, year after year. It means that this is the true distribution of our property taxes, ladies and gentlemen. It is not what the civics book tells us, that 54% go to the Board of Ed. No, it's more like 34% of the property taxes that we collect and use. So how much money is left on the table? So we did this elaborate uh, crowdsource investigation, basically working our way through the city's completely hard to use website, but we managed to crack this nut and can tell you how much money was left in the TIF accounts at the end of the calendar year, which is kind of an important piece of information, right? If we're so broke, the answer should be nothing. There's nothing in the, we went to the cupboard, the cupboard is bare. Well, we added up uh, these 154 TIF districts have reports, we opened them up one by one, added the numbers, and hold on to your seats. That's how much was left in the TIF accounts. So at the end of both calendar years 11 and 12, these TIF bad boys had a total of almost $2 billion sitting in them. How about that? The, the comment was made, that's how much we just borrowed. Well, if you add up the, the, the deficit of the city or compare it to this, the, the so-called deficit of the Board of Ed, um, you know, you're, you're, you're approaching these numbers and this is not magic beans, right? This is, this is property tax dollars. There's nothing strange about this. Uh, there's nothing more fundamental, actually, about, our, about how our government works. You know, it's, it's from your house, what you pay, you know, to make the city run. And even if you're a renter and you don't, you don't own, it's still your, your money goes to your landlord and he or she pays property tax. So it's everybody's business what happens to these TIFs. $1.7 billion. So... Um, as I say, we're trying to answer the question, what's happening at the ward level? So we're in the 27th ward. The Civic Lab is located in the 27th. So we took a look at it, and we're able to tell you uh, pretty definitively, thanks to uh, our data volunteers, one of which is sitting in the audience right now, Mr. Bill Drew. Give it up for Mr. Bill Drew, because he's, he's, he's the guy that uh, really helped us crack this nut. But we're able to say, with some definitive um, sense here, here are the 12 TIF districts inside the 27th ward. And here's how much each of them took just from within the boundaries of the ward. So this is a little bit of data mining. And working with our great graphic designer, Carlin So, we're able to make this map for you. And the answer is, in 2011, the 12 TIFs in the ward took $37 million. So that's a number that's never been reported before. And we've done this work now in, uh, for 24 wards in 100 
and 40 TIFFs, I believe, have been illuminated. So we call this an illumination. So the, the poster gives you the basics, you know, the kind of like, you know, TIFF 101. And this is designed to be read in the laundromat. Like, you know, you just leave it and you pick it up and go, what the hell? That kind of popular education, that's the kind of explaining that we need to do here. And we also have a version of Spanish. But then when you open it up, then you see, oh my goodness, I live right there. It, it makes it much more easy to comprehend. So you, you see the map. And the other thing that we show on the map is who got paid. Because after all, this is Chicago, right? And we want to know who got paid. So this is a list, a spreadsheet that we generated. Um, and from that spreadsheet, we, we put it on the map. But just a few, a few of the things that we found out about who got paid in the 27th Ward includes $7 million for Mariano's Fresh Grocery. Mariano's is a subsidiary of the Roundies Corporation, which makes, took, took in about $2 billion. Mariano's, um, you know, I'd say it's a modest upscale place. My wife loves it. Um, great donuts. But why did they need $7 million of public money to open a grocery store in Greektown across the street from Dominic's, which, as far as I know, did not get public money to build their store. Now, they are out of business, but the point is, who doled out $7 million to Mariano's or to Roundy's? Uh, well, the answer is the alderman and the mayor did it. Also, uh, Blommer's Chocolate, $8 million. Where was the decision made on that? Anyway, it's a long list, as you can see, of projects. And we have a list like this for every ward. And when we come into the ward to do these illuminations, as I say, we've done about 24 of them, this gets the most anger when people start seeing these projects. UPS, Target, Home Depot, Walmart. Excuse me, did you say Walmart? The world's biggest co company got $11 million to build a store in Pullman. Did anyone ask the people in Pullman if that was a good deal? Well, when we were in Pullman, they were said, no, no, no one asked us. No one asked us about giving money to Target down the street or Jay's Potato Chips or um, Solo Cup or any number of these companies, some of which went banked up almost immediately. Borders Books. Oh, $4 million. Oh, well, they closed their doors and took their money with them. A lot of times we're in a, com in a community and people will say, we know that business. Uh, they're gone. They moved to the suburbs. And anybody here of Republic Windows and Doors? $9 million from the, from the 32nd Ward TIFF on uh, Goose Island. They shuttered their company in the middle of the night and tried to move to Iowa to leave all their workers stranded. The workers barricaded themselves in. It's a worldwide sensation. There was a book written about them and a documentary, and that was enough to shame the city to try to get some of that money back. But technically, it's, it's, it's no strings attached. You give this money, and off it goes. So these are some of the things that we've been finding out about TIFFs all over the city. Um, now I'd like to just briefly share the TIFF Hall of Shame. These companies all receive public money. Coca-Cola, a very needy company, right? They got $3.2 million. The Mercantile Exchange, uh, $15 million. The guys that bought the Sears Tower, they got a Welcome to Chicago gift of $3.8 million. Welcome to Chicago. Here's a bunch of money. Um, and my favorite, Grossinger Auto. I call them out every, at every opportunity. In Hyde Park, those of you that are from the south side, you know that Harper Court uh, has been being developed by the University of Chicago, which is a billionaire. And they are putting a Hyatt Hotel, which is owned by the Pritzkers, billionaires. And somehow they managed to wrangle $5.2 million for that project. So here's the situation where a billionaire owning a project, owning land, chooses to develop it and brings in another billionaire <laughs> um, whose, whose co-owner happened to be on the Board of Ed at the time, and the Board of Education was closing schools because we had no money. And the Prisker family enjoys this gift of $5 million while she sat on the Board of Ed. Now, I call that, at the very least, a huge conflict of interest. Well, she's now our, our Secretary of Commerce. Anyway, people in Hyde Park, very upset about this. Uh, up at the 46th Ward, this is very controversial. 
Um, the, JDL Development, with the blessing of Alderman Kappelman, wants to put a luxury high-rise. Originally, it was for $26 million, and now, uh, after community protest, it's down to $11 million. So after strenuous protest, the, the amount of money that the uh, developer wants has been, has been reduced. But they're still organizing up in the 46th to stop this. Uh, and what we just found out is included in that development is a private park not open to the public. So they want to use public money for a private development to, and partly they want to use that money to build a private park which you can't go into. So how's that for logic? Uh, maybe the biggest controversy right now in tax increment financing giveaways is in the second ward where they want to build, the mayor wants to build a stadium for DePaul. So the, log the logic here, let's see if we can break down this logic. Right now, the Blue Demons average about 4,000 people a game, a mediocre team at best. Sorry, if you Blue Demon fans out there. This stadium will have 10,000 seats. So where are the other 6,000 people going to come from to fill the stadium? And DePaul being the richest Catholic institution in America, why do they need $55 million when we're closing schools, cutting back services? What's the logic? Here's the logic. The mayor wants to put a casino down there to be attached to the convention center. And this um, stadium, this, this arena, if you will, is where Beyonce and Elton John are going to play to entertain the gamblers. And they're going to go over the sky bridge from this, this facility to the nearby casino. You heard it here first. At the Civic Lab, we create maps, and I showed you some. This is a map that we've created that also shows the TIFFs, which are the green dots, and the schools that are being cut and closed. So this is a map with teeth. And we share this map with the teachers union and parents groups and other activists that they can use it to organize around uh, their school closings and their school cutbacks. And you can sort of see the logic where a lot of projects here being funded with public money, within, sometimes within line of sight of a school that's being closed or cut. Uh, we've done other research that shows uh, how TIF money is being f uh, flowing into charter schools. And we put a couple of petitions online, one of which has about 3,400 signatures. We invite you to join us with this particular petition. You go to tinyurl.com, empty all TIFs. And uh, basically, we're telling the mayor to release that $1.7 billion, send it back to the units of government that should have gotten in the first place. If that were to happen, the Board of Ed would get a one-time infusion of about $980 million. Could ha be helpful, no? Could solve some problems. Um, the Sun-Times agreed with us in an auditorial in, the, in, the, in August, hand over TIF surplus to cash city schools. We like to think at the Civic Lab with this TIF illumination project, we like that we think we help make that headline possible through this kind of research this kind of action-oriented, get it into the street, explain how things are really working, and get people angry. And we think we, we accomplished something with that. All right, that's it for the, for the Civic Lab and the TIF Illumination Project. Consider yourselves illuminated. <laughs>